Yes, I'm looking for I'm looking for the embracing moment, uh, the, the moment at which the field, the electrical energy, um, uh, actually, will say touches the human body and hence creates um, a, a change in the body, so that the body is aware that there's something th that's in its environment uh, um, and that and it has the potential to cause an effect. You know, when you think about it. Um, uh, 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 light, for example, uh, the light leaves the sun and it begins traveling to Earth and it takes many minutes for it to come and you could be looking and not see the light until the moment the light actually enters the eye and even after it's entered your eye, you still don't know it's there. It's got to travel to the back of the eye and interact with a special cell in the back of the eye. That triggers uh, a, a series of changes. This is a process that we call transduction. It's a changing of the, of the energy from light into the language of the body. Uh, that change occurs, it results in a signal to the brain, then you say, I see. It works exactly the same way for electrical signals like signals that come from a mobile phone. The theory, based on, uh, based on the evidence that we, we have produced so far, um, is that um, uh, this, this embrace takes place um, uh, uh, exactly the same way that, that, it, that it takes place for other ordinary stimuli, light, sound, touch, for example. Um, and, and it consists of a, of a process uh, whereby um, the, the stimulus, the electrical signal, for example, uh, uh, interacts with a specialized protein on a special cell in the body. I mean, there are these special cells in the body for detecting stimuli. The, the, uh, the body detects light uh, with specialized cells in the eye. Uh, it detects sound with specialized cells in the ear. Well, it also detects electrical signals from cell phones, for example, uh, via specialized cells. Uh, and it detects them in the same way. That is to say, the immediate consequence of detection is a is, a, is a, a change of a particular protein, the net result of which is that uh, ions in the body move from outside the cell to inside the cell. That's the classic way a signaling cascade begins, resulting in a message to the brain, which, uh, which, which uh, the brain can interpret as something out there. The earliest, um, the earliest consequence um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that occurs after the signal interacts with uh, with the specialized cell that that detects its presence um, is a uh, what's called a neural impulse, a, a signal that travels along the nerve uh, uh, um, to the brain, to the central nervous system, and uh, and uh, uh, the the brain then processes that information and and orchestrates uh, whatever. Um, the, the, the compensatory uh, response uh, ought to be to protect the organism. Um, a, a good example would be uh, if, uh, if the stimulus were heat. Now, if the stimulus were heat, uh, uh, there would be certain cells in the body that would perceive the heat. The information would go to the brain. The brain would then uh, um, uh, analyze the information and then turn on the compensatory mechanism, which for heat might be uh, 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 opening the pores so that the body now uh, is able to get rid of heat. Uh, right. And so that, that's, the, that's the standard uh, stimulus response system that takes place at an automatic level. You don't think that this is hot, therefore I'm going to open my pores. It's an auto-regulatory process that takes place in the body. It's highly dependent on the nature of the stimulus. Uh, if the stimulus, for example, were heat, I just explained one compensatory response. If the stimulus were um, cold, then the compensatory response uh, would be to turn on the shiver response. So your body begins to quiver and hence makes more heat. Uh, the, the point is, uh, there is this uh, neuroendocrine-based system. It's a system comp comprised of the nerve and various endocrine organs. And it has evolved over, uh, over eons of time uh, in, in, in order to take in information and to make changes in the body to best accommodate this information. If, if the information that, um, that you took in was the sight of a, of, a, of a lion who happened to be walking across your path, 
then uh, one of the compensatory mechanisms that's going to be invoked is your ability to run very fast, much faster than you would have run otherwise. Well, there's a biochemical basis for that, uh, uh, for why you're all of a sudden able to run so fast where you never ran that fast before. There's this um, very famous uh, um, uh, insight that was generated by uh, Hans Selye, a very famous physiologist and physician uh, back in the 30s and 40s, I think this work actually began. It's called the stress response. And the, the singular insight that he had was that this system can be triggered by multitudinous diverse stimuli. That is to say, many, many different things that can, uh, that can be presented to the, in, to the individual, but the biochemical changes inside are all similar. Uh, uh, and they all have one basic goal, which is to protect the organism. It's a, it's a response adaption process. Take the, one of the two examples I used earlier, let's say heat. Um, if you have uh, a, 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 an organism that is exposed to heat over a long period of time, uh, uh, th there are certain phases uh, uh, with regard to health that occur. And initially, um, the body's compensatory mechanisms are turned on and the body begins to cope with the presence of the heat. Uh, uh, for example, opening the pores so that energy can be radiated. But, but if we ask ourselves, um, what happens if the heat is maintained? Uh, does the body simply begin to cope continuously over a long period of time? Well, the observation is after a certain period of time, the body breaks down and some illness, something adverse takes place in that organism. Now, precisely what occurs depends not only on, on the organism, uh, it depends on other factors in the environment. An animal that is heated for too long could develop various kinds of s symptoms depending on what else might be in the environment. For example, if the environment contains some uh, bacteria that cause pneumonia, uh, what you could expect to see would be an increase in the pneumonia rate in the animals that had this heat stress. So it's, it, you couldn't say that the heat caused the pneumonia, but you could say it brought it about by uh, overtaxing the body's compensatory mechanisms, and that's why the pneumonia developed. Electromagnetic fields work exactly the same way. They make it more likely that you're going to develop disease because, um, because your body's compensatory mechanisms are being worked by the presence of the field. And I'm talking over long periods of time, not five minutes or 10 minutes, but, but five or 10 months, over a long period of time. Your body's compensatory mechanisms are taxed, and then they're taxed to some limit because your ability to, your resistance is finite. It's limited, it's not infinite. When it breaks down, then a disease develops. And the identification of the disease depends not only on what we've talked about up till now, but also other factors that are in the environment. If you look at the scheme that I just described, uh, a protein detects the field, uh, it sends a signal to the brain, the brain then orchestrates a response. Now, if you focus just on the activity of the brain in that model, the brain is receiving electrical signals and sending out electrical signals. Well, th the activity of the brain in doing that can actually be measured by putting electrodes on the scalp. Uh, so, and then you can, you can distinguish uh, for simplistic purposes, we'll say two states. There's the state of the, of the brain when the field is not present, and then there's the state of the brain when the field is present, hence the signals are going up and coming out. Uh, so if you, if you apply a field, you measure the brain waves on the scalp, and you see differences uh, um, due to the presence of the field, then you can, be, you can be scientifically confident that the brain is actually responding to the field. And I have spent a lot of time studying this system at that level. It certainly does. Uh, that, that's, the whole, uh, that's the whole basis of the concern for public health. Uh, because all of the fields in the environment, mobile phones, um, uh, high voltage power lines, microwave ovens, these fields are all um, what, what a laboratory scientist would call low. That is to say, um, they, they, they do not cause immediate and obvious effects. They are below uh, the, the level of sensation. That's, that's what the word low means in this context. And I'm talking only about low. I mean, the effects of high fields are, are trivial in, in comparison.
uh, particularly thermal effects. Uh, now, uh, ionizing effects have to do with electrical signals that come from other kinds of sources. Cell telephones don't make ionizing uh, uh, signals. Uh, uh, high voltage power lines don't make ionizing signals. That represents a completely different form of physics and biology compared with what we're talking about.